This is a great day. Honestly, a legend like you on Transatlantic, it's a gift. Thank you so much. Well, that's, that's kind of you to say, and uh, thank you for inviting me. <laughs> Listen, at Transatlantic, we believe that each of us is an ocean of erratic thoughts and wild feeling. Your ocean must be amazing, to say at least. So I would say, let's go through it. The Seven Seas interview is ready for you. Let's start with the first question, okay? Good. First, sound reigns supreme underwater. As a matter of fact, it travels five times faster than in air. If you were to drop a microphone six miles down into the marina trench in the Pacific Ocean, instead of quietness, you will be listening to the sound of earthquakes, ships, the distant moans of the whales, and the overwhelming noise of a category four typhoons that just happened to pass overhead. At Transatlantic, we believe that everyone is an ocean. So my question for you is, if I, if I were to drop a microphone at the bottom of your ocean into your soul, what sounds I would be listening to? Um, you know, you, you'd hear all kinds of music. That's what you'd hear, yeah. I constantly listen to music. It's my, it's my favorite of all the amazing art forms. You know, um, music is funny. You, you can't explain why you like or you don't like a piece of music. It's totally visceral, totally visceral. It, flow, it flows through you. You feel it or you don't. And um, I, I think it was Keith Richards who said it was a neck down art form, neck down. You can intellectualize it. But you can't convince yourself that you like it or don't like it. In fact, I mean, there are some incredibly well-respected love musicians who I don't like. And it's, no. The better way to phrase it is, I don't get, I don't get them. It's nothing against them. I just don't feel it neck down. It doesn't flow through the rhythm of me or whatever. And so, yeah, so that's what you'd hear, a lot of different kinds of music. And um, maybe the other thing you'd hear is uh, what I hear every day when I meditate. Yes, I meditate. Um, I got turned on to it by Andrew Robertson, my partner at BBDO, the CEO of BBDO. He read about TM, the practice the Beatles did. And, uh, and he read about the proven metrics of how using science, it, it lowers cortisol, which is the chemical in your body that it contributes to stress and lack of sleep. And um, anyway, so, you, so you, learn, you learn to do this thing. They give you a mantra. They teach you how to do it. And off you go. And I have to say, it's a natural way to throw off stuff. And uh, I'm, I mean, I'm sure any meditation technique is, is, is helpful, but I like this one. And so what happens is you, all the stuff that's bothering you or like that's stressing you out, it kind of comes through you out like dreams do at night. And um, you sleep better and you, you feel better. Oh man, so the, the, like your first answer holds so many gems inside. Like <laughs> the neck down art form of Keith Richards and like, you know, talking about sound, I found out that there is a, a scientific explanation of the fact that when you stare at the ocean, you feel like meditative. Content no doubt, no doubt. And so I read that is the sound of the ocean and the motion of the, of the waves that triggers something in our heads, in our brain. And so yeah. the waves match like the movements of the brain thinking and give you that kind of like contemplative like state of mind, which I found like fascinating. So man, so excited to cross the ocean today. Second question, the generational gap between a father and a son can be as vast as an ocean. There is a lot of water that run in between and cover, to cover the distance can be challenging. I know I think of two because I had a troubled relationship with my dad. During the Broadway play, Death of a Salesman, Dustin Hoffman, who was playing the role of Willie Loman, a frustrated salesman, invited his father to watch the play. Now, only a few people know that Dustin Hoffman's father was a salesman and he wasn't a successful one. He was very frustrated. He didn't like the business. Now I hear that your old man 
was an ad man. But I think that he had a different approach to the business of yours. So my question is like, did he pass on something to you? Did he inspire you? Or did he show you what you did not want to become? Well, no, he actually had the same approach to the business. He, oh. he believed in creativity, creativity as an economic multiplier for clients, the, the same way I do. I believe in it. I believe it works. And, um, but he only did it for about five years or so, and, and he was quite good. The difference between us was that he didn't love it the way I do. And as you well know, Simone, if you don't love it, the uglier dynamics of the industry can make you, you know, hate it. <laughs> you, the love trumps all the frustrations because you love it. If you don't love it, a lot of frustrations. So, um, but he did it during a time when I was a little kid and um, when I was really impressionable. And he would bring me to the office, you know, when I was a little kid and uh, it seemed like the coolest place in the world, like, uh, like uh, the hippie-ish looking people making creative things. It was fantastic. And uh, so I kind of got the bug then, you know, and um, the coolest thing he did was uh, a campaign for Listerine. And this was back, I don't know, you know, 1971 or whatever. And I guess they introduced a, a competitor that had a scope and it had mint, minty taste. And it said it's, it's, it has minty taste, so why have a taste of uh, medicine? You know, because Listerine tasted, it didn't taste good. So he, he did a campaign about it's effective, and that's why it tastes like shit. That's why it's effective, because it tells these things. And the, the line was, the taste you hate twice a day. It was clever, very clever, <laughs> okay. like, use, okay. use it, use so it. Um, but anyway, he, didn't, he was very good, but he didn't love it. And he later became a, a teacher, and then a professor, and then the dean at the College of Communications at, at BU at Boston University. Wow. And he loved that, and he was really good at that. And so the lesson, a long way to answer your question, is do what you love. You should do what you love, and then it's, it's not really work. <laughs> Man, it's so beautiful. It reminds me of one quote from um, Charles Bukowski, and I say, like, find what you love and let it kill you. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's a good. That's a good way to put it. Yeah. Yeah, that's a great quote, and I remember that. You know, I used to visit like Bukowski uh, graveyard quite often when I was living like in Redondo because he's like uh, it's cemetery like in the Palos Verdes, and like, every time like I used to go over his graveyard and like you know I just talk to the man <laughs> like a crazy man. I always had in the back of my mind these quotes like find what you love and let it kill you, and you're so right. You know, if you don't love this business. Like, you know, you out because like you will not be able to stomach all the wrong things that this business gives to you. So also the constant rejection and oh my I mean God, yeah. well, I get rejected as much as anybody, you know. But you know, there's that there's that great Japanese proverb uh to live by, uh fall down seven times, stand up eight. <laughs> I love that man. I love good. Third question. If anything works in my career. In my case, accident takes over. These are the words uttered by Francis Bacon, one of the most soft after artists of the 20th century. His tribute to the sea can be admired in the famous painting, uh, Figure in Sea. Now the thing with Francis is that he will gamble everything on his next brush stroke. Not just that he was like, a love of gambling, but he truly like lived his life gambling everything. He didn't plan for nothing. However, he built a legacy. So when I look at your career, I see a masterpiece. Undeniably for me, I know that you want to be like, you know, modest, but man, your career is a masterpiece. My question is, did your move happen by chance did the biggest decisions in your life were made by other people or you plan everything along the way first of all thank you for saying that but it's it's not a masterpiece it's just the result of a crazy amount of work and um yeah i did plan a lot of it i did um now look there's always happy accidents that happen in your life your career in your life um like when I was a kid at Shiat Day, and I'm talking about when Jay Shiat and Lee Clow ran it and it was a privately held, there was some confusion where 
there was this guy, Bob Cooperman there, and he thought Lee promoted me to be a manager, and Lee thought he, so each guy didn't promote me, so I, was, I got accidentally promoted, and I, but I took advantage of the, so that was a happy accident. <laughs> I didn't, I didn't let, I didn't, I was terrified. I didn't tell either one of them that, like, neither of you, but it worked out, you know. So, so things happen that are accidents, but I planned most of it. I did. I mean, first of all, there was a big picture. Follow the path of great work. I believe in creativity. Believe in it. Um, and then go, I haven't had many jobs, but go where you can go to do great work and where you can learn and where each step is scary and new and uh, more challenging than the one before and force you to do better and, and learn new things and, you know, to learn new things, to unlearn things, unlearn old stupid tropes that are darn good anymore. You know, yeah, I planned it. Hmm. Hmm. You know, it's like funny because I read somewhere and somehow we apply it to my journey that uh, some of the biggest decisions of our career in our life are made by the people like you know you say that that, that guy like you know promote you like mistakenly and then you took advantage of it so yeah. that's how we plan it you know but there is always like a third party there is always like an external force that comes and somehow steer the boat somewhere that you didn't think of True. And, yeah, that's true. But even though that happened by accident with the promotion, the planning part was get myself into Shy Day, which at that time was just so amazing. I, so I planned to get in there. And then like happy accidents happened in it. Right. No, that's so, you know, it's, kind of, it's probably a combination. And I'm sure Francis Bacon planned some things. I like people like Miles Davis or, uh, or Gearhart Richter. Mm -hmm. Like they have these stages where they, like I've done this, now I'm going to, and they kind of plotted out this course and each phase was like a chapter in some amazing novel. But there was planning. Absolutely. No, I mean, I, I'm sure about Francis Bacon. You know, I always tell the story of J.D. Salinger. You know, he, he, before he wrote the, what is considered like the greatest American novel, um, Catch Him in the Right, he spent an insane amount of time uh, adjusting his style and writing uh, in the way the New Yorker would accept his writings. So for many, many years, he would literally like uh, flex his writing, his style, just to be published in the New Yorker. And that's like very careful planning. Yeah, I mean, Long after he got published a few times, then he was able to develop his own true original style and come up with like, you know, the catch yeah. in the ride. But it sounds romantic to say like, oh, I just fell in. He, he, he worked very hard at stuff. And in fact, the people in this industry I admire in our business are the ones who every year have great stuff over decades, like, like, like Prince or Dylan, like not like one hit. They had one hit and they live off the fumes of it. You know, people like that out there who are like, they had one or two things and 20 years later, they're still whacking that horse, you know? I like every year people who deliver. Every year, that's hard to do. Yeah. Those are the ones I really respect. Yeah. Good, man. That takes plan. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Okay, look, fourth question. Now, where does one ocean end and other one begin? Uh, while this question seems to have a simple answer, the reality is uh, all the world waterways are connected. So basically, we only have one huge ocean. Now, there are no borders within the water itself. You sit at the helm of one of the biggest network in the advertising industry. It has, and correct me if I'm wrong, you know better than me, 2089 offices and 15,000 employees. It's a vast ocean, right? So my question is like, where does one BBDO begin and another one end? From your point of view, is it all connected as one ocean or it's all like scattered around the planets? Yeah, that's a, that's, a, that's a good question. And we consciously see it as one ocean. Um, you know, we have a, there's one brief at BBDO, the work, the work, the work. That's our mantra. Uh, it was written before me. I don't take credit for that one. The work, the work, the work. That's what it's about. And, um, and then all the offices, if they're doing great work, they're on brief. If they're not, they're off brief. 
it's that simple and that challenging. And um, it's pretty interesting how this network was put together, pretty, pretty uh, ingenious. Um, and I like to think of us in a kind of a category of one because of it. So back in the 60s and 70s, when uh, BBS started to expand globally, instead of just setting up offices in different countries, like, oh, we're in Milan, build, build one, they, they, bought, they bought or bought interests in the best boutiques around the world. So Clemenger was a great boutique. AMV, fantastic boutique. Almap. So you have in this, in this, in this array, this collection of entrepreneurial, founder-driven, creative boutiques. And I like to say that we're a global boutique because we family together with the same kind of values and a sort of a certain kind of edgy scratch to our work, nimble, fast, quick, not like a big dinosaur network. Um, so it puts us in kind of a category one. I like to say we're a global boutique because we're big enough to do these big things, but we function. And by the way, all of us came from boutiques. Most of us, all the leadership, uh, leadership team from Andrew Robertson down. So we, we come from that background and our dream was to work in uh, that type of style, but like on a much bigger stage, a bigger canvas where everybody saw the stuff. And, uh, you know, we've been fortunate. We've succeeded more than we failed at it, you know? And, um, so yeah, it's one big ocean. Oh man, it's like, I love the notion of the boutique because I think like what the boutique gives me is, uh, is, you know, that kind of definition of like global. It's like global, but it keeps like the local uh, alive. It doesn't kill anything of the culture of the place where you guys go. And I think like boutique is also something that has, for me, some kind of like a bohemian spirit that is kept alive. Like, you know, and I like to think that we're talking about bohemian, you know, just a few days, just yesterday, actually. Unfortunately, I read the news that uh, Lawrence Ferlinghetti passed away. Yes. And, uh, you know, I used to visit his bookshop three times a week when I was living in San Francisco, City Light Books. It was uh, one hell of a bookshop. And in the universe of library and books, bookshops was one of a kind. And he founded this bookshop upon the idea to have a cultural hub, a boutique of intellectual, rather than a corporate bookshop. bookshop. Yeah. Yeah, and Michael McClure and all those guys hung out there, and uh, yeah, so yeah, it was pretty. Yeah, I I didn't realize I I didn't realize he was 101. He you know, was that's, one. That's, that's a good run. That's a good run. <laughs> Man, I would put like my signature <laughs> to live a life like that. Anyway, good. So the next question is a story of water plumbing and submarines. Yellow submarine. The title of the 10th studio album of the Beatles takes its name from a plumbing phenomena. The submarine represents the plumbing in the old European houses. In the old days, plumbing made a lot of noise, making sounds like being a submarine. I know that because I grew up with the noise. <laughs> As for the color yellow, Paul McCartney say 1966. I was just going to sleep one night and thinking that if I had a song, it would be nice to be on a yellow submarine where all your friends are with a band. Now, I had this vision. If you were to write a song and sing it with all your friends the day you retire, where would you want to be? In a submarine or you want to be somewhere else? Well, let me, let me try to answer it this way. <laughs> That's not going to happen. <laughs> <laughs> and it's never going to happen. And the reason is, I'm not going to sing any songs with my friends the day I retire, because that would mean I would be bringing attention to myself or celebrating me. Hmm. And my whole career has been about attention to clients. I'm invisible. Now, yeah, I give speeches at Cannes. I write articles. I make presentations. I'm doing this. But it's all in the service of talking about BBDO and our clients. And my end of career goal, the day I retire, not to be singing a song on a submarine. Here's what I want people to say. I really don't know shit about that guy, but he did a bunch of good work. What a beautiful line. Man. Work says it all. I, I'm like the anti-Neil Young. Like better not to burn out. I, I'll fade away. 
<laughs> you are also like, uh, you know, there is the poem called like, don't go gentle into the night. Was he a Dylan Thomas poem? I don't remember. So you do. Oh, I'm going, I'm going gentle into the night. You're going gentle into the night. <laughs> You're going gentle into the night. Right? And they're not going to know what happened, but they're going to say he had some good work. Uh, he had some good work, whoever he was. That's awesome. <laughs> okay, good. I see the shore, man. And it made me sad because I would like talk to you forever. But uh, look, a reservoir of water is hidden in the earth mantle, more than 400 miles below the surface. Now, all this water, three times the volume of water on the surface, is trapped inside rocks. So basically, there is an ocean below our feet and we don't know it. Or worse, we do know it, but we don't care too much about it. Our creative business is made of many layers and one can remain on the surface and just drift through or you can decide to go deep and deep and deep. As of 2021, do you think there is anything extremely valuable to our business under our feet that we haven't explored yet? Or do you think that What's on the surface, what's before our eyes is everything. No. Well, I think everything worthwhile in advertising or in, in life is beneath the surface. Mm -hmm. Everything is, you know, um, and you have to do the rigor and the, the discipline and you have to explore and penetrate that thing to find out what's really going on. Mm -hmm. You know, I always thought that's kind of, I'm not, I don't want to sound falsely modest. I thought I was a, when I was a writer, I was a good writer. But there were people way better. And I think, I think um, and then I'm like, how come I'm selling some things and they're not, and they're better? Because I think that exploring the below, the, like I got into the clients, the neck down part of the client, the visceral things they were feeling that they were scared of, or they worried about it, that they wanted to, so I was able to kind of get it. And then, and then I thought, well, if I work with some of these A plus amazing people and I could tell them and then together it'll be better than apart. And that, that's kind of what it's been. So I think everything is an exploration. And by the way, most things, this is what my dad always says, it's like 5% of things are really great and everything else is sort of surfacey, right? Uh, movies, books, uh, restaurants, uh, your relatives. <laughs> 5% are good. <laughs> yeah, you, no. dad, you, you gotta dig was, down and find it. Your dad was like completely right, man. It's actually, when you read a book or you read like a collection of poems, for instance, like, you know, it's very hard to find a collection of poems. And 5%, if 5% are good, it's a really fucking good book. It's really good, yeah, it's really it's good. good. Less than that, like, you know, you still like it. But it's like, it's, yeah, it's hard, man. So yeah, you're right. 5% is good and the rest like is unnecessary. <laughs> anyway, the, this question is the last question and we ask this question to all our guests. So if, they were, if there was a wind that blow your sail and if I were to ask you to name it, what would the name of the wind be? Hmm. Well, uh, again, I... Like we've talked about like constant rigor and penetrating the issue, dig digging under the surface. Uh, and again, I think I mentioned people like Prince or Dylan who every year deliver. So that means like, so I guess the wind would, would be, you know what it'd be? The show don't stop. <laughs> 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 that's what it would be, show don't stop. Show don't stop, man. That's, that's how awesome. I literally sum it up like your career so well, man. Look, David, I'm grateful for this talk. And I know that you don't want to hear this because you want to be invisible. Like, you know, yeah, the man, he did like a bunch of good work. But man, what a lesson, what an ocean. And thank you so much for being in this industry and to give this industry what like, you know, inspiration. So I commend you for being on board in Transatlantic. You are a wonderful captain. I wish you all the best, my friend. All the best to you too, Simone. Thank you so much. Bye-bye.